call this meeting to order at 634. Madam Clerk. Present are David Hurd, Joan Fonts, Marilyn, Jordan, Marilyn, Don Hughes, David Fidel, Don Hughes, Julie, and Mr. Chairman Salvo. I would call this. All right. Um, any citizens want to address the finance committee? Sure. Please approach the table. Since this was the chairman's first meeting, I thought I'd say to stop in. I'm glad to see that you're finally on time. I thought that after my three years with of uh, devoted duty to the uh, FinCom, that I should stop by and at least uh, give you some guidance for the coming year. The thing that's probably the most important is that. As you go through everything, you've really got to get down to the basics. And once you get down to the basics, you start to learn the things that are the real truths. Okay? And that's truly important, because I don't want you to be able to force in the next year. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Hey, boy, if that doesn't set the tone for the, for the new year. So, uh, <laughs> are we going to skip over the town administrators and work for just a minute? <laughs> there. We want, to, we want to introduce our we want to introduce our new member, uh, because I'm sure they're just busy with us. So Joan, Joan, I was you Joan, Marilyn, and David. So if you'll start with uh, Marilyn and just tell us a little. I, I, I know you before. I didn't meet you, yet, but just to give us a little idea of, of uh, about you and your background. Well, uh, my name is Marilyn Jordan. I'm married. I have four adult children. I work um, for accountants and attorneys for probably most of my career, although I did do a lot of third party billing and, and that um, I've had a second home increase. That Working in the uh, with the uh, in the legal profession with attorneys, um, I was born and raised here in Wareham. Went through the public schools here in Wareham. Graduated from Wareham High School, um, and uh, after retiring, I came back home, built a home in uh, the Oak Hill section of Wareham, um, and got involved with the uh, betterment uh, issue. And I got involved with uh, with that, and got interested in the uh, committee of finance, and um, seeing what we can do to help the town with their issues and problems. David Hurd, uh, been coming to Wareham since I was probably less than a year old, spending summers here in the last. Uh, five years I was building a house and living here. Uh, I'm a professional in engineer by trade. I have a degree in engineering. I have a master's degree in business administration. I worked in the, <clears throat> I volunteered in, when I was in Plymouth on the uh, 
Board of Appeals. I worked on town meeting there. I was a board member at Jordan Hospital for about 20 years. Uh, right now, I'm a part-time consultant with the nuclear industry working at Tobin Nuclear Station. Uh, been involved in or interested in finance from my own personal aspects. I was the president of the condominium association for about eight years. We ended up starting out with a negative balance in the budget, and negative balance in the checkbook, uh, and ended up after the eight years with a, a positive, positive cash flow, a reserve fund, and it was interesting watching how if you're careful about your money, uh, you can make it go a long way. You know, in Wareham, it's got a long way to go. So I'm trying to help here. That's my objective. Thank you. Just to, just to briefly, before I shut up for most of the night now, one of the things that I, I've been toying with is in order to really understand what we do, and it takes a little time, but one of the things, if you go to the bylaws, and I believe it's uh, Division I want to say Division 4, because I yeah, Division 4, Section 6, it says, it basically says that shall be the duty of the Finance Committee to consider all matters of business included within the articles of any warrant for town meeting, and it shall be the duty of the select committee immediately upon drawing of the town meeting warrant to transmit a copy of such warrant to the pen conference. The Finance Committee, after due consideration, shall write, report in writing such recommendations as is deemed best concerning all matters contained in the town warrant relating to the appropriate appropriation of money or which would entail the expense upon the town as such. Anyway, basically go down to that. We, our main charge is to advise the public. And we've had some issues in the past with town meeting as far as getting prepared for it. And this year, I think that's going to be the focus here is, is preparing for town meeting. That's also going to lead us into some other areas. But the main goal is going to be that we need to be educated on the articles. We need to discuss them. And, and we also need to be prepared to talk about the town meeting. So it's, it's not an easy committee to be on. It's not a uh, <coughs> it's not a fun committee at times. It's, it's a great committee, great people to work with. But we have a lot of work to do between now and our fall town meeting and then Serious amount of work between that and our springtime meeting. So, Derek? Yeah, probably most people don't. Worry. We have that facility here, but actually, we better bring that over here. Man. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Yes, am I allowed to say welcome to the new members? <laughs> and thank you for the Diet Coke that keeps me going. Um, the first thing that I'd like to bring forward as a bit of good news is the local legislators override the governor's vetoes, which uh, brought, brought approximately $177 million worth of unrestricted local aid back into the coffers for the local towns and cities. What that meant for us is we were not cut by 232,000. So that is, uh, that was probably the best news I've heard in a long time. What I'm passing out is from the conference committee, the local aid estimates about a few don't mind, uh, versus what we've actually voted at town meeting if you look at it, and I'll wait in a second for it to be passed out to everybody. There's two sections. The first section is the local aid estimates, and the second section is the local aid assessments. If you look, um, the FY 2014 conference committee is the numbers that I believe are going through. So there was a small reduction to the aid and uh, charter school reimbursement to the schools. And on the town side, there was an increase in the unrestricted general government aid and a small decrease in the state-owned land. 
So altogether, um, the estimated receipts is $34,336. On the second page, don't be alarmed seeing what would be a negative at the bottom. That is a good negative because it's a reduction in our assessments. Uh, small, small reduction in mosquito control projects and really the large reduction were in the school choice sending tuition and the charter school sending tuition, which all together was uh, $43,917 in reductions. So a little over $78,000, $78,253. What my suggestion would be for this is to not appropriate it to anything. Last year in uh, December, we had mid-year 9C cuts from the governor and uh, we were looking at cutting approximately $20,000, which means when you're cutting 20,000 in the middle of the year, you're cutting actually 40,000. So uh, I would think that we hold tight and use this money uh, just really as a safety net. So I would not suggest we take any action with these additional funds if this is what comes through uh, in the fall town meeting. Question. So where will it sit? You know, just in the budget itself? You don't want to like, you know, free cash. You know, uh, It'll fall to free cash. Yeah, it would fall to free cash. Okay. It's just additional. It's additional revenue on the local aid side and a reduction in our costs on the expense side. Okay, so it, it actually will sit as free cash. Then, yeah, it would, it would flow out to free cash if there's, you know, depending on what your expenses and your your revenues are, but that's the simplest way to say how we flow through. Very good. Um, do you know whether the difference in the assessment from school choice and the charter, is that just part of the overall what you're giving back or is it change? Is it because of numbers within our school system? Yeah, I wouldn't know that from the way it came through. Don't care, it's good. Yeah. And I also agree that I don't think there's any reason to allocate these funds because there'll be more than plenty of reasons to allocate them before you Anyone else? The next thing I'd like to speak about is the closing of the 2013. Uh, our fiscal year ends on June 30th, but what a lot of people do not know is the books remain open till uh, July 15th. You have the additional time. You can use the Municipal Relief Act to make additional transfers. We did not need that this year, which is a good thing. Wow. I think that was the, the first year that I've been, since I've been here, we, albeit not too long, that we haven't needed it. Uh, we did have a late town meeting, which was, uh, which was a boon. Um, but when people are asking for the year-end numbers, there's still going back and forth through the schools and our accounting department, and even through the water pollution control, they're still making some of the adjustments. As soon as those are available, I'll bring it to the Finance Committee, and we know, as always, until the auditors go through all our numbers, those are the true final numbers, at least we can give what we believe are the, the final numbers for the year. Do you have a time frame on that? I've asked Judy, you know, what, what are we looking at? Um, I'd say we're, we're still several weeks away from getting that out. One of the big things is she is currently interviewing what you would call as contractors to come in and help with the year end uh, to make sure that as we go forward, the, um, the books continue to run on time. So what we've been seeing in the past is when you're going back to, and we had these issues in 2009, or fiscal year nine, fiscal year 10, when you're going back and working on all the old issues, if you will, you are not concentrating on the current ones. Well, the current year is just as important, if not more so, than what's happened in the past. So last year we brought in later in the year after we had lost the town accountant, um, the, the Marion town accountant, we brought her in as a contractor. Uh, she was excellent, she, she ended up knowing our system pretty well. Unfortunately, um, her house burnt down. And I believe the quote was, I cannot build a house and deal with wearing him at the same time. So 
Uh, we've, we're interviewing other ones, but we believe we have somebody coming in. So that's why, just to let everybody know, if you also saw in the account of expenses, you'll see that that had increased this year uh, to make sure that we would have enough help in that department because we knew we'd not be able to hire anybody, but at least we could have contractors coming in that would be able to work on it and make sure that we are staying current while also working on closing the books and getting everything ready for the Department of Revenue, setting the tax rate and our auditors. What is the typical time you bring in somebody as a, as a contractor? How long? There is no real typical time. What have we done in the past? The last time we did it, uh, we've had one for nine months, which was BMAG that actually acted as the town accountant. Judy from Marion was in, I believe she was in from November and still was doing some work in, in March. So this one we would love to have the books all closed up, setting a tax rate before December and knock on wood, an ambitious goal for this town is to have free cash taken care of before the October town meeting, which is a real lofty goal, but it's if we're not aiming for something good, we're just staying in the same world. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but we don't, we've never, this is sort of new ground for us in working with the contractors. We've revamped the, the finance department. We've created the position of a finance director, but you can't enact that until 60 days after town meeting is closed, which is August, I believe, would be August 19th. So now we're going to have a finance director. We will have a town accountant, uh, and they also have a staff member, as well as the head assessor. And the treasurer collector is actually the, is the same position as the finance director. And that's what we brought forward to town meeting. So this is all relatively new ground, but actually having somebody besides the town administrator looking over the finances we thought was a good thing to put together because now you have somebody that can look at that every day, isn't concerned about HR aspects, isn't concerned, you know, that there's a, um, a, a for lack of a drowning in Shell Point, isn't running out to that because that's what this town, I think, has really lacked. And the person that we're, we're bringing up to that position has been an assessor, has accounting background, and being our treasurer collector, I believe, for geez, I almost think 15 years or so, is the reason that the DOR and both our auditors reported was the only reason that we were able to get our audits done and our tax rates set for two years when basically there was a financial mess. Let me rephrase that then. What have you allocated for a contractor for the fiscal year? $20,000 altogether. Uh, last year, the bid for the hourly was $75, so that can get eaten up pretty quickly, especially when you're looking at numbers. But for the first time, they're not recreating the fiscal year. Uh, the, the monthly exchanges between the treasurer's office and the counting office were much further up to date. At this point last year, believe it or not, what they were working on was reconciling cash to back to the beginning of the fiscal year instead of reconciling cash to one month behind. So by keeping ourselves ramped up, it's it's almost like school. When you fall behind, the work is so much harder to, I'm to not, do. I'm not questioning the need for it. I was just wondering what the cost was. Yeah. No, I will also, I, and so that everybody knows, I also explain things pretty broadly because I know we have an audience that watches. So while we may all sometimes understand the terms, I'll go, I'll go a little bit beyond so that uh, everybody can understand because this, this municipal finance can be a bit of a bear if you, if you haven't had any experience. With it. So. Anybody else? Okay. All right, now the... Uh, the bag. I've put together the first preliminary five-year budget projection. So, I know you probably didn't want to see it tonight, but well, I wish I had that early. 
I think that's great. I don't know what's on it, but I think it's uh, great to start with. Well, with what I want to do in the future, too, is I want to get to the point where we get these a little bit before so that it's easier for us to talk mm -hmm. about and we're not sitting here spending our time reading the room then talking about it. Yeah, I think uh, this would be a just, <coughs> I think the easiest thing for me to explain right now is just how I came up with some of these and, okay. you know, we'll have the, uh -oh. the numbers that we're looking at. So as you'll see, this is for fiscal 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, we've kept the new growth at a stable $275,000 a year. That's been, you know, we fluctuate somewhere between about 350 to 248 over the last two fiscal years. And the way we're having a bit of a turnaround we see in the permitting, 275 is a safe bet. Uh, going through it, the, the, the um, financial aid that we received from the town, excuse me, from the state, is just we're increasing that by a small 1% per year. Uh, you know, we really haven't, over the historical, been receiving more than that. So. Uh, continues through the, the general aid. What I did for the local receipts and reimbursements was I took a four-year average and then started increasing them by 1%. We know we've done some things such as um, such as bringing in the new hotel for the local agency <coughs> occupancy excise. However, until that is truly built out, I'm, I'm not even going to estimate it. That, other things that we've done is increase the fees in the inspectional service department. We know that we once we get the, all the permits in for for the hotel, maybe the additional build out down at Rosebrook plus Walmart, there'll be a few booms of big money in here. But again, it's it's better to be to be <coughs> safe than over project. A state study on what we're bringing out from the Harbor Service permit fees, just a small increase by $5,000. I know that that's something that Mr. Buckminster will be, will be looking forward to, to having. Uh, if you see the water pollution control employee health and fringe costs, what I've increased those by are by our increases in health insurance and also for the uh, for our fringe benefits. So that's why those are going up and should be going up about 106% every year. Going into the going into the actual expenses for our departments, I brought up the wages at a, a 102% that would include the people that are coming in with steps increases, if there were <coughs> any COLA increases and such. It's, I'm not saying that that's what would be given out, but that's, we have to look at worst case scenario. Right now, the four collective bargaining agreements that we've ratified were for fiscal years 2012, fiscal years 2013, and they were for 0% on the base but there was some increases, whether it was additional steps or one-time payouts. Uh, the sad thing about this increase is when you go through it, it's been keeping our workforce at the same amount, and we know that municipal maintenance is going to have to increase, and in order to get really the overtime issues and safety issues, we're going to have to bring additional staffing on the police department. So that is where I'd say this is probably not quite as, as high as it would be on some of the costs, but right now I don't see us, even though it, we have those needs, increasing our staffing. Snow and ice budget we've maintained at the just increasing it by a thousand dollars a year. So if you look, uh, you know, you're, you're facing roughly approximately with just the two percent increases and such a two hundred thousand dollar 
a year increase, and that's to wages and uh, expenses. One of the things that I know we're done with, if you will, is cutting expenses. We've now hit the point where we can't take from the expenses anymore. And I think it would be something interesting for this committee is to look over the last four years where the percentage of expenses and wages went for, uh, for what our town has been doing for, for the town services. Because over that period of time, I believe, when I've been looking at before, we've moved approximately $230,000 out of expenses and put it into wages. So at some point, we have a, we'll have a municipal maintenance department that doesn't have enough bodies, but also doesn't have any, uh, any sort of ability to do work if we continue in that fashion. Page six of seven, you'll see the school. I've kept them as well at the 2% the increases. Debt service, the fixed cost, I've used what, uh, what Mr. Mr. Foster has on his chart. We know there's going to be some increases on this. We know that being brought before the town meeting most likely will be a uh, bond, no, well, we won't go for a bond issue, but state house notes to borrow for the school roof to fix the, the whole amount. We believe that our costs will be approximately 400000 after reimbursements of 68%. Was it not an article? It was an article on town meeting board? We fixed the uh, town, we fixed the, the gym yeah. roof. The rest of the school needed it as well. What's dropping off between FY15 and FY16? Uh, I would have to look specifically what borrowing Something items are. Intended. Yeah, but as we're, we've been going through, we knew that we'd start hitting where it's going lower, and yeah. but we've now started more programs where we're borrowing again, so we'll probably hit what's essentially a status quo period. We know that F15, FY15, we're going to have an increase because we did the ban on what we did for the with the capital items that we did for barring for you know, the the um, gym roof, the library, uh, I believe if it was bus, the three used vehicles that we purchased as well. Uh, the employee benefits obviously are going to be the ones going up the most every year. What we have done this year, uh, as I think we've spoken about, we've changed the splits with the employees, the school and town employees through uh, section 19 of, the, of what we're able to do with the bargaining. Uh, the estimate right now is over the six years of the agreement, it's going to save the town four and a half million. So, excuse me. What was the split change? It was year one, change from 75-25 to 70-30, and then years two through six is 67 and a half, 32 and a half. Mm -hmm. And the employees did not receive anything back for it. We initially went through the process <coughs> of going towards the, uh, the GIC or GIC-like plan and in working with the employees, they liked, they wanted to keep uh, some of the companies that they have, such as Blue Cross, but this ended up saving the town over that period of time more money than if we'd gone to the GIC. Um, the GIC's been a bit scary because the state has not been putting in their portion. Uh, one of the things as well with the health care is we will be looking into going into moving away from self-insurance and joining some of the local programs, whether it's the Plymouth County or um, we've been approached by local hospital groups as well. And that's something we need to keep in mind because uh, this is too important to realistically have have it where, um, whether it's myself, somebody else in the future in the town administrator seat, being able to make a decision on what funding's in there. It should just be, we get the bill and we have no option but to pay it because we've learned from the healthcare holiday that that's, you know, it's too much of a temptation. 
of uh, going through the rest of this, you'll see the retirement contribution. I've just been bringing it forward as we've seen from what we've received from Plymouth County. LIUNA is the Laborers International Union. They have a separate small pension that the town pays into on an hourly rate, and that's been uh, bargained and is in there. Uh, workers' compensation has been increasing dramatically every year our costs from the insurance and uh, I, I don't see that going down you can see that's one of our largest costs general liability going up as well uh, the FICA going up as our as our uh, not really bringing any additional people on but if we're projecting wage increases we know that the, you'll be paying more in FICA as well the state and county assessments, and this is the, what realistically offsets what we receive from state aid. And if we look at over the last 10 to 13 years, we essentially received today uh, almost a million dollars less than we did back in 2000. And one of the reasons is while our state aid has gone up, our assessments have skyrocketed. Part of the assessments are what you've seen on page two. Uh, county assessments are small. Retired teachers health insurance. Retired teachers automatically go to the GIC. So they're not part of our, uh, our health insurance. Uh, the big ones that have been changing and which has really hurt the town and uh, uh, the town as a whole is the tuition assessments. They have been skyrocketing and that's been one of our major costs. The overlay, that is what we set aside for abatements, the senior work off program, and you'll usually increase that every year, and especially if you're going into a reval year, which I believe FY15 is. The next item that we have is the Upper Cape Cod Vocational Technical School. Uh, this is I started looking at this and I know this year we had a major jump up and a part of it was from, well it's we increased, uh, we had an increase of students going there because of a decrease in some of the other towns that seemed to be, while our as costs have gone up because we're approximately 33% of their budget, that, that fluctuation was just such a giant one that didn't seem that we would have the, the $500,000 one every year because it, has, it hasn't been that way and we wouldn't I wouldn't see a nine percent change in our in our students every year because it means everybody else would have to be falling out and if we continued on that at some point it'd be Wareham Upper Cape Cod Technical School mm -hmm. there'd be nobody else on there so uh, still you'll see large increases in that so moving forward it's interesting you'll see in FY15 it all of this projected out, we would have a deficit of $667,000. FY16, you're almost doubling that. So you'll see we have a structural deficit easily of, uh, going forward of close to $700,000 a year. Now the surplus and def deficit isn't, uh, isn't cumulative, that's the aggregate for each year. And if you looked at it, you'll, you'll see that we have close to a, a $7 million deficit if you rolled it all forward into FY18. So, I gave you the good news first. Anybody? Mr. Trudeau? Derek, <clears throat> when we had the Cape Cod Technical School here, our representatives on the school board. Uh, their answer really wasn't very satisfactory in that uh, we come to the town if, if, if requested. And I think they've lost point of they're representing the town, not as a participant over there on the school board. And since we have our selectman representative here, I'm hoping that in the future we can focus in on getting them involved in some of the town goals and objectives so they have a clear understanding of the finances and the finances of the town governments. But right now I don't think that they are responsible to the town. They're responsible to the school. And I think that's 
an area that needs focusing. Yeah. Thank you. Through you, Derek. Derek, I see in the um, available funds and the projections um, from now to FY18. Um, Town isn't planning on any any real any tax real estate sales at all. Is that something that we're going to try to plan to um, bring into <coughs> revenue or tax real right, tax real estate sales? You can't put them in your revenue. They automatically go to free cash. You're not allowed to budget them. Go ahead. So, so I just, you know where we might be thinking of that you would have additional free cash. But realistically, as we've put forward the policy, part of that free cash is going towards the uh, the rainy day fund. Yeah, yeah that's, I can't think of words now. <coughs> the only reason why I mention it is because it's, it's one of the available funds. You know, it's listed there with, with no uh, projective income, you know, yeah. for the next year. Is that, does the town have any plan, though? There's, there's, we're, We've actually got one planned for August, and then there is another potentially large one before the end of the year. Mr. Foster has been excellent at seeking two things, the tax title revenue, and as well doing the, the uh, real estate sales. We did an RFP for an auctioneer service as well, and the auctioneer, in the past we paid them $5,000, and they essentially just showed up. What we've done now is they'll put a buyer's premium and they are responsible for the RFP to have advertising out there in, uh, in, in newspapers. We have it listed from the Boston Globe. So it's the papers all over. It's not just the local one for $60 a week. And they, they also have lists of who purchased their properties in the past so that they know they have viable buyers as well. So, this is something that I think will help increase what we get from our from our tax sales. Sure. Capital items. The capital, we're we're going to have to fund that with free cash. Is what it looks like after what we send to the reserve fund. Whatever you have left is realistically where your capital plan is. We simply, as a town right now. We don't have access for for funding in our in our general budget for capital items. Um, I, I noticed that re revaluation is just like a skip. Is that are we putting that somewhere else, doing internal, or what are we doing? Now? We're trying to do it internally, and what I would need to do is see what where we might stand. This fall is really going to tell us what we need to have done. Uh, spoken with the. The head assessor, and at the end of last year, we hired somebody for $10,000 to come through and pick up a lot more of the properties. One of the reasons for that as well is we don't want to miss, up, miss out me, on the additional revenue from new growth. You miss out on new growth one year, and that's compounding into the future of really what's missed revenues. Uh, we had put out for a, a data collector slash assistant, assistant assessor, and it really hadn't worked out. Um, and in a strange way, it was lucky at the end of the year because, as we all know, we needed every dollar to make it for the, the FY for the team budget. Okay. All right. <coughs> now I get to play. Oh, more. So what you're telling us when you look at this, and before I go in and start talking a little bit about some of the things in the idea that selling, obviously the, the revenues are conservative. You're not, you don't have any of the, the room occupancy or any of the things to build out if they're going to do a build out over at uh, Rosebrook. I was going to say Brook Farm, but uh, over at Rosebrook, the, the, none of the revenues are in there. The second thing that sticks out to me is that obviously we have to have a capital plan for the police vehicles. That's one of the things we've discussed in the back in, in the past. Not that we don't have other capital needs, but this is an ongoing situation that you know only we end up with this every two or three years because we don't plan ahead in there. The one that kind of jumps out at me and, and I just I don't think it's realistic is, is the school. <coughs> uh, you're increasing by two percent, and I don't think you know that's 
going to work 10% because we clearly that we clearly have have a situation now where we went through last year where the state were cut back a tremendous <coughs> amount and I, and I just don't think that going forward that's realistic for the schools but the bottom line is you're telling us that it doesn't work you know you're, you're looking at a structural deficit that is seven a little bit over seven and that's what can obviously with conservative revenue numbers so you're, you may see a little bit from revenues but these expenses are also conservative on several levels as well and they don't include any of the increase you talked about with municipal maintenance right. and, you know, or any of the increase we need in, in the police department so has any or i know are we given any thought to a plan that obviously we're going to need in order to survive five years we're going to have to i would say Yes, but it's going to be it's going to be um, administration and the elected bodies and the boards and committees working together to figure it out um, because we know we've we've said it and uh, I don't think people believe us because we've, we've sort of said the sky is falling for so many years that when when it's actually hitting us on the head, people still still think there's the that magic fund hidden out there, that there's still the uh, health care trust fund or some other way to come up with, with money. Uh, you know, even when we have a large amount of free cash, that's uh, it's going to the reserve fund, and then the rest is buying our capital items, which we so desperately need. And you're right, we've only kept the $50,000 a year in capital, which essentially brings you, it brings you maybe three cruisers on a lease. Uh, the only other item is I think we've we'll be able to have an ambulance plan on the additional 70,000 for a few years which is which is great but yeah you know, those are just those are just vehicles for two two departments not the not the major ones that's going to fall out of municipal maintenance not, not anything else um, mr. Trudeau through you mr. chairman might I suggest that this capital planning uh, is Internally destroying us, and I, I believe the police cruisers and the ambulance should be part of their budget as an expense item. But our failure to allocate funds into capital planning means that if I didn't put funds into my house to repair the roof, the porch, and the deck, they fall down. We are doing that year after year because we say we don't have the funds to make new repairs. If anything, the finance committee needs to be able to try and put into the budget some capital items as a minimum because if we say we're funding it with what's left over, we never have anything left over. And it's a shame to see a beautiful town buildings just to continue to deteriorate and, and I know you understand this Derek it's just that it's so frustrating at the monetary level to, to know that those kind of funds are not budgeted directly each year and, and my thoughts Mr. Chairman I think that was the general thought that we had at the town meeting. The first one, one of the reasons we reject the budget is there's been no attempt to attack the capital issues of this town. And we have a report that states there's several of them and they to grow. And I believe uh, the vice chair will tell you that our assets in this town are devaluing every year. And we're not repairing them. It's, it's, it's costing us money that way as well. Like to add on to your comment, um, the basis of the budget that, although we got it to balance by FY14, I don't have a lot of confidence in it because it wasn't a long budget. Um, you're right. There's a perception of this fat out there. Not much, and I'm concerned that there are other items in here that just we know that we don't have capital. We don't have personnel. I think there's things like the veterans benefit. I don't think it's kind of for as much of an increase as I project that we're going to see given what's going on politically. Um, this is a town that veterans come home to. 
we will be liable for those benefits. We have no say in that. That's underestimated here. Um, but to your point, he's just put this together. This is where we start. This is where we make our plan from this. We no, there's no miracles. The, the town doesn't get to win the lottery. That's how I do my budget when I don't have money for the roof. But, you know, buy a lottery ticket. Maybe it'll work. We don't have that option. So this is where the hard work's going to come in. People are just going to have to figure out what it is we need and, and what it is we want. So thank you very much. And I'm sorry you got to do this. Sorry, we have to look at Thank you. It's a, it's really it's a great start. It's where we start. I don't think that we got it this early in the past either. I believe it was a little later that we got it. But uh, that certainly uh, more than okay. that it's critical to get that There's no festive spirit after we. I, I think that number is critical. I think we start talking about the five year deficit. I'm aware of I think from, from my end, that's all the pleasantries except the one thing that's going to affect this building here. Uh, I was speaking with the, the superintendent, Dr. Rabinovich, and they've, <laughs> speaking of capital items, the, the Everett building, which they, they'd applied for funds in the past to fix, has now come to a point where they can't have employees and that there's enough mold issues and such where it's a hazard. So they've moved some over to Hammond School for the time being until that gets leased out, then we've got, we have the school administration partially in the town hall. So we essentially have a school that has to drive 15 minutes to, to each other to have a meeting. It's, it's sort of, it, it's crazy to me. So what we've done is working with the, the school is with the career center moving, we will now bring the school administration and their curriculum management all into this building on the third floor. Uh, on this floor where the Council on Aging is, we're going to move the Council on Aging downstairs to be with the daycare as well, with two, the two entities that should be together. They both serve as the seniors, and having them having to go to different floors is, I think, a little onerous. The other item is that now gives us Town Hall free and clear of the school which isn't to say a negative, but it allows us, if we realistically want to shut Town Hall down for one day a week, such as the plans have been in Plymouth and such, uh, it gives us that opportunity. We couldn't do it when the school was in there. Uh, they, not to be obstinate, they weren't going to shut down, change all their stuff and shut down for one day a week. So we would have had literally running the, the heat in the whole building for just two offices. So it never made sense to, to shut it down. But this gives us that option and just reduce reduce what we use in electrical costs, reduce what we use in, in heating costs, and also may allow us for one day a week to, ex if we do that, to extend the hours so persons don't have to, or residents, taxpayers, don't have to take a half day off from work to come do their business at Town Hall. Town Hall will be open until 7 p.m. at night. They can come in. I think it will service the taxpayers uh, and residents a, a little bit better. We've also received grant funding from CERPED to start the e-permitting program, which will, as we phase it in, will allow people to actually look up permits for people as well. Part of the day we have is people will call up and say, well, can you research such and such a street? I want to see if they, they have a permit on the, on the home. It, you'd be surprised how many calls like that come in in the week and how much time it takes. And you, you have to answer that. So people will be able to look it up. Contractors that when people don't want to do business in this town will be able to look up lots of land, see what it's zoned as, see what they're able to build. So I think this is the first step in really, really doing something that's going to benefit the town. It's also, and it's, <laughs> I don't know how to explain how this happened, but our software, permitting software currently for inspections for the harbor master, for the selectman's office, and for the board of health, were all with different vendors that didn't communicate. <laughs> <laughs> so, this will now bring them all together and communicating. Absolutely. So, I'm not. So if somebody's coming in.
for a vote warrant, the harbor master can plug in their name and see whether they owe tax or boat excise tax. And they will not be able to get that warrant until they're paid up. So it's, it's really, it's something that I think is going to work well for the town. We're phasing it in, and it will also allow our inspectional services. Uh, we'll have the tablets for them. Driving past the house, they see some work being done. Instead of having to drive all the way back and see or call up and see what's going on, they can plug in and say, oh, yeah, yep, no. now they don't have it. Okay, let's shut it down and get the, you know, let them know they have to come in and do the proper permitting. So it's a, it's a step in the right direction. I need you to stay around for a couple of the items. Just, I don't think we're going to have much to say about the, the 2014 budget because you covered some of the changes already that we needed for that. But we want to talk a little bit about the town meeting process and the 2015 budget process. You got a handout in your folder that shows the process for calling town meeting. It's a fall town meeting. I went to a meeting on July 9th, I believe that was the day, with the selection. And one of the issues, or one of the reasons for that meeting was that we needed to discuss the process and how we could make it better how we could improve the process and one of the, a couple of the comments I think that most people agree upon is is we need to follow the timeline as laid out in the charters and the bylaw that that is the critical and the other is to have confidence in our financial numbers which we will as they start coming in regularly so this this is a uh, first step I believe uh, our town moderator put this together no you know, the office staff puts it, puts it together based on the charter. Okay, based on the charter. So this is the process, and this has a, it's critical to us because this is the process as a, as a committee we're going to have to follow to make sure we're prepared as well. And it, uh, I want you just to read it over. And I think some of the critical dates for us, and really it's all critical, but uh, we will have the warrant. We usually get the warrant the day after it closes a draft. A draft. Because if we wait. I'm sorry. Wait. No, that's okay. No, usually the day after we get it. What's it going to be? So it closes on September 17th, we should have a draft in two weeks. I would trust Kelly on this. Jesus. Whatever she said. Yeah. So. We are probably looking at September 18th, which is according to our little schedule. A Wednesday. A Wednesday. How a timely Wednesday. can that be? It looks there's a little star that says they want to receive warrant. Yeah, you have a in the back of this, uh, Kelly's also put together a critical dates on a calendar. So we should that's a draft warrant on the 18th, and that gives us time start working on it because ultimately August October 28th is when we will have town meeting so we, we have several things that have been brought up uh, the town administrator asked us if we would like to be interested or if we are interested in taking over some of the process of preparing the motions uh, one of the things we've had a problem with in the past and I'll, I'll let the yeah one of the things we had a problem with in the past is we would get the motions a day or two before. Now, one of the, our duties at town meeting is to read the motion, so it's difficult when you have it two days before and sometimes not until the day of it. You're trying to figure out what it says. I, I personally vouch for that, and it may be different than what's up on the screen. So this is our opportunity to, to do it up front. We will be part of the motion writing process. So if you want to. I, I actually agree with that, and I was trying to push for that the last town meeting. Um, Part of the reason is that way, if it's not in grammatically correct English, or it's not, it's our fault. We need to take more ownership of that. The, if we're the ones that are going to stand there and read it, I think that we need to have a little more say in preparation of it. So we will figure out how to coordinate that so that we can work with you, Claire, Town Council, to make sure it's correct. But I think we're all on the same page that the um, the warrant closes and, and it goes out. <coughs> so that the warrant gives notice and the motion just really transfers into what we're going to move from that warrant article. So it's not, shouldn't be that technical. If we have to fill in the blank at the last minute, it's only one blank. We've seen most of it. Right. So I think that we'll find a way to get through that. And, and 
my understanding is you're very critical to filling in those blanks, especially if it's a monetary item and it has to, money has to come from somewhere. But this way I can buy it instead of Claire's. Well, that's what I'm thinking. Do you want to add anything about the timeline? Well, yes. Um, and I think there's been several areas of concern that I've seen over the last couple of years that I think we really need to have an honest discussion about. And, and I believe that we'll be meeting in August for us. Um, one of the things I think that we have corrected, and it's going to be a big help to the Finance Committee, is there was some confusion as to when you go through the setting up of the time frame, whether you count back from the actual day of the first the first night of town meeting, or you count back from the day of the meeting. So we have determined and have it on, on town council's um, advice that the actual day that you start from is the town election. So that's going to give you about three more weeks exactly. um, going into the spring town meeting uh, that you uh, have that weren't closed earlier, three weeks earlier than what you've had it in the past. So I think that's one thing that we've done that's going to make a big difference to the Finance Committee. In terms of writing the motions, um, when our former town administrator was here, um, having come from the city, it was a little bit foreign to him how you put all the motions and the warrant articles together. And one of the things that he had asked me to do was to come up with a guide. And so I did that. Um, the putting of the warrant together comes under the hands of the Board of Selectmen. They are in charge of putting the warrant together. Sometimes it's very difficult because they haven't been getting the warrant until the night that they close the warrant. And I think that that's something that needs to be discussed at our August town meeting that maybe as we go along, in, in Derek will agree with me that we sometimes have five or six different versions of the warrant by the time we get to the date of the closure because it's a moving document and things come up that you have to adjust either the warrant article before it closes or the motion before it closes. So it's, it's not an easy process and it, and it does move and change and there are changes which I think is one of the reasons why administration doesn't like to see it go out until the end product, otherwise you would have so many versions that it gets very confusing. So it, it, it is a complicated process to put it together, but um, according to our charter, it says that warrant articles can be submitted in no particular form. And I think that's something that we should take a look at. And having worked with the former town administrator, what I did was put together a guidebook for petitioned articles to sort of help a petitioner in it outline what is an article, you know, what, are they, what things do they need to have in the article, and then how do you morph that into your motion. I think if we can take that component that we've given to the petitioners and give it to the department heads, or give it to whoever is sponsoring the article, and have them uh, write their article, write their motion, write their explanation, it would be very helpful in not only to the Board of Selectmen as they go through the warrant articles, but to your board as well, and to Kelly particularly, because I know it's frustrating to her the last days of trying to get everything to go to print, and she's looking for explanations. So I think if we can put some of those components together, I think we'll find that the process would be a little better. And those are some of the suggestions that I'd like to make when we do meet in August. Um, I think it would be helpful. I think having the selectmen see the, the warrant articles as they come in. Um, I find that there's been some articles that have come before us that, and, and for the Finance Committee as well, when you make your recommendation, you have a zero, zero, eight vote because you don't have any information. So I think you need to do a better job in that respect, that you have the information that you need about warrant articles before the warrant closes so that you can discuss it. And if uh, someone needs to come in, you can have them in. And that should all happen before the warrant closes, not after the warrant closes, because the time to make the changes is before, not after. So I think we'll have a productive meeting in August, and I think hopefully we'll make um, some changes that will make the process run a little smoother. August 1st at uh, 5, I believe it's August 1st. around 5, 5.30. Five, five. Um, if 
any, uh, is an open meeting that can come? I would assume so. I don't really want Dom there. <laughs> no, it, it's a meeting though, it's the, the town moderator, the chairs. Chairman of the Board of Selectmen, mm -hmm. town council, the town clerk, the school superintendent, right. who also, you know, the school brings in warrant articles that have to deal with the school, so. Okay. What are we doing I think um, the chairman of the Board of Selectmen was looking okay, at no Thursday, the 1st of August, at about 5 o'clock, there's a workshop at 3. Okay, yep. Town Council's usually in on Thursday anyway, so um, he may be willing to stay for right. a little bit, and then we can sit and really talk this out and see how we can make the process. I can because I think that. if you prepare better for town meeting, <coughs> town meeting is better. So I think we have to start at the beginning and work from the beginning. Okay. Uh, I know town meeting is getting a little better, but I don't think it's where I would like to see it. I don't think that you'll get much argument from the finance committee either on that. I, I think we would like it to be a lot better <coughs> for us as well. And I think one of the critical things, when I come to the finance committee, um, after I hear the motion and I ask what the vote and recommendation of the committee is, I think that there should be some explanation from the committee why you voted the way you did. That's really going to give the body a sense of why you're either supporting it or not supporting it. And that would be helpful for them in making the decision on whether they vote yes or no on it. Um, if they have a good reason why you support it, and again, if every body that participates in town meeting comes in an agreement, the school committee, the board of selectmen, the finance committee, then generally the body is going to really support the article or not support the article depending upon what the recommendation is because they know you've all talked about it, you've all come together, and the consensus is unanimous okay. in, in what the recommendation is. Mrs. Couture? Um, to get back to the Finance Committee writing the motions themselves, I mean, by the time we're done with the warrant article, doing our recommendations, etc., cetera, um, what I've seen happen in the last couple of years is, that, that upsets me is that I feel like the motion gets hijacked before it ever gets up on the screen, okay? Um, we had agreed many, several years ago, that we would treat every article in the favorable um, motion that it, that it was made in, whether it's presented by the Board of Selectmen or, no, or another um, town you know, agency or it's a um, a petition article that we would present it in the positive fashion that it was given to us. Our recommendation from there there is totally different in what our vote is. All right, but when it comes to writing the motions, I'm not understanding why we feel as though it's the finance committee's um, responsibility to write the motions because I've gone to town meetings where I get handed a motion just before I walk up on the floor because. Somebody has decided that the article is being withdrawn, the article is being changed, whatever. So I'm presenting a motion that's not at all how it started. So I don't, I don't know how those things happened, and that's why we had left it to legal to decide whether an article was, um, was okay legally before the motions were written. I don't understand why we're, why we're going back to, okay, the fin club <coughs> is going to write the motion because then, okay, we're going to get to town meeting and something else has changed and we're changing our motions. And, and I'll address that. It didn't happen this past time, but this next time it will. And I volunteered to do it for this first time around. And if it doesn't work after that, we can see. But that gives one of us and it doesn't have to be me, anyone else that wants to work with me can do that. Mm -hmm. yes. But one of us will be in on that process, Bonnie, so that we don't walk into town hall, get handed motions, and be told, oh, that's not happening. So we actually have notice, we'll be in the loop, we'll be in the communications, we'll be in the email chain, so when something is withdrawn or changed or the numbers change, they have to come to us first, because we're the ones who are going to read it. I don't like standing there with the motion. I'm all set to make my motion and someone rushes up and says, oh no, it's supposed to be this. So we at least will have that knowledge ahead of time. So and so these will be fully vetted with legal oh, yeah. as yeah. you go that's, along. That's, uh, we're not writing it in a vacuum. We can write our opinions and our recommendations outside of anything else because that belongs to what happens here in the committee and that's our words. But the motions will be done as part of the process with the town moderator 
and legal, and it'll go back and forth. It just puts one of us. I don't know if you wanted to phrase it maybe town meeting liaison so that we have that more more connectedness. I think that's the whole point of having this workshop is to have more connection between all the committees that go to town meetings so that when we have an article that you have a proponent that's going to stand and speak to, you make sure ahead of time that they're there and they know what they're going to say um, so that you don't have questions. So that it's a question for the Conservation Commission or a question for the Building Department to find out Hopefully all that will have been done ahead of time and you'll say, you're going to be there and when somebody asks the question, you'll be able to answer that, right? Because I don't think that we're well dressed rehearsed before we go into town meeting to make sure that everyone knows what their role is supposed to be as far as jumping up and answering questions and even making the motion. So that's just to try to smooth it out for now. The next year we'll do it this way and see. But, but part of the process, not on our own, not us working on it and having someone second guess our motion. I don't think that we're writing the motion. I think it's a team effort and we talked about it, but it gives us a piece of the puzzle that we don't really have. We're, we're getting the motions. We, you know, we're, we're in the dark up until that point and now we have somebody or more one than something. I, actually I, I guess my, my, real, uh, my real question to <coughs> this whole thing is that I didn't understand what was so difficult about writing the motions if they were presented the way the warrant is presented in a positive <laughs> attitude. Except for the fact that <laughs> inserting numbers we don't have at the last minute, then, I mean, the motion is the motion in the positive form that it was presented in. It's up to the floor to decide whether it goes forward or not. Yes. And I think we got away from that somewhere well, along we, the line. We did, and, and we're now gaining three weeks before town meeting that we didn't have before, which will help us have us better prepared for town meeting. And I'm pretty sure I would have loved to have those three weeks back every every time I've been involved in, since I've been on the finance committee because it, it does make a difference. And we also are now, the selectmen are involved in it. And they're, they're I don't want to say they're promising to be better gatekeepers, but I think they're going to be more diligent gatekeepers, which help us as well. We. It, it certainly has been frustrating to see them close a warrant and vote on the articles without ever hearing anything. But at the same time now, they're going to be part of the process too. So everybody's in, involved in the process. And actually we discussed just having the clerk read all the motions as opposed to individuals. If it's on a Tuesday, I'm not available. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. so that's um, the meeting is on August 1st. Is, this, or is it gonna be another one on the 8th? Is it, is it the 8th? I believe you have the first and the 8th. Or? No, I, Just the, the only point. email I've seen from the chairman of the Board of Selectmen was one that went around to see if we were available on right. the first. So I'll, uh, we'll be there, and if anybody wants to be there, where's it going to be at? I don't know. Okay, don't it's a mystery, but I'll yet. get to everybody else. I will let you know. Is there anything else on the process? Okay. Next up, the, I, I think we can kind of, in a sense, take the audit management letter. Uh, and the sewer enterprise. Oh, thank you. Yeah. The sewer enterprise together. In your packets, there is a long overdue. The power consultant audits. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that everybody's read these. Because I'm pretty sure. Not I just got them. Right. So, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. but we. Well, let's take a look at, uh, in general, one of the things that uh, I want to mention is we're behind the eight ball already on this. Uh, this is something that we normally would get March. Is that correct? About March? Yeah, I would say we, we might even get the mansion letter. Yeah, the water. It's, uh, yeah. That's a repair. So, uh, so, so we, we potentially should be getting that, excuse me, earlier. Yeah. But we're not. And, and from our standpoint, not that we're going to be able to do a lot about it. There is no audit committee at this point, or there is an audit committee, but we haven't even that. So we don't know what's going on with that. Um, where we started at two years ago, <coughs> where we are now. It, it doesn't look like, obviously, in the management letter that we're lighting the world on fire. There are still several items in here, but they're better than they were. And the com commentary by the auditor is, in fact, that you know, we are making the right 
we're going in the right direction. We're, we're, when he talks about the current status, it talks about updating. We are doing better at this. But I, I'm sorry, I, Mr. Chair, but obviously you've read this prior to our receiving well, this. I feel a little out of the loop. <laughs> Maybe if you would like to okay, have Mr. Sullivan to... give us the highlights of what he feels, well, and, I was and then we could, I, we could read this later. Yeah, that, what I was going to say, should be I, I saw this meeting. because I'm, I'm part of the audit committee. I understand I saw that. So Wait, what I'm going this was in the newspaper. Oh, yeah, it's also it's in the sorry. newspaper. It was in my fine. Twitter too. It's okay. So what we need to do is probably for our next meeting, just everybody homework, look this over, and then we'll talk about it in detail. <laughs> is that okay? Because I, I just, I, it, we're making progress, but it's uh, before you go and read it, understand that you're reading this one and you're not reading the past one. So if it sounds real bad, you have no idea until you see. Would you like a copy of the password? <laughs> I think I've read the password. It's a okay. lot bigger. It is available. Okay, so that's the out of the sewer enterprise fund. You were going to give us an update on the sewer enterprise fund as far as audit. And no, we we had the hours and solvent come forward because uh, the term forensic audit had been put out there. And to be blunt, for the sewer enterprise fund, if you're doing a forensic audit, you're tracking down every single problem that's ever been in there going back to 1977. That's, it's, it's not the viable option. What really we want to look forward to, and one of the, besides the everyday transparency, we know that the sewer commissioners are now transitioning from the Board of Selectmen to a new elected board. So we'd like to turn it over to them with a clear understanding of what's in their retained earnings, where it comes from. You know, there's simple answers you can say. Well, when people people tie in, if you haven't already budgeted and there's a $200 fee and you haven't budgeted that as revenue, then that's going into retained earnings if the expenses haven't gone up. If somebody prepays um, their, their sewer betterment, that's going towards the retained earnings. If you didn't expend all your items uh, out of let's say your energy line that's going towards retained earnings if somebody had brought in more septage or grease than what you budgeted and the sense that's going towards it but people really want to see almost a breakdown of the percentages and we've gone through with powers and salt and they do have a good understanding but one of the other items and it's sort of a leap of faith is to bring the Department of Revenue in to do their audit of it for us. Uh, two reasons, it's, it's really, that's the department that oversees all of our finances and approves our free cash, our retained earnings, <coughs> the pollution control facility, so they do know how these funds work and they're the ones that also uh, really oversee it. And number two is that is a free exercise so we've reached out to Jared Curtis of the Department of Revenue to try and see how that gets done, how where we would be in the queue, and we uh, we don't have the best reputation with the Department of Revenue. So right. that, you know, so this goes for a long way. I'm, I'm hoping towards having them jump on board and take us as a priority. So sometimes. Uh, the bad reputation maybe can be a benefit and will help us pop in the line. So uh, that's the generic version of it. Um, at one point, we had budgeted in somebody to work with Mr. Campino on the financial side over there. Has that position been filled? We started that, or are we going to wait until the audit and we know where we stand? He did hire somebody to come in and work with them, also put together spreadsheets. Uh, what we've always asked the departments to do is, besides made our, our accounting software, which our servers went down today and still aren't up, but that's a, that's a side note. Um, it's still their new business, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've always asked them to keep a separate spreadsheet. Now, that's much easier for a department with two, two to three hundred thousand dollars than it is a six, six point nine million dollar business. But uh, Mr. Campina had brought in what he called his banker, which is a, a cute term for it, but it was basically in the job market that we have, a highly skilled person that is out of work 
that we were able to pick up for for pennies on the dollar of what they're really worth come in and put together spreadsheets and I'm talking about ones where you're dropping down it's automatically calculating something that that department believe it or not hasn't had uh, we need additional one of the things that's happened is we've had the outside world has changed but a lot of the way we've done business in the town hasn't kept up with it we have people that and there, there's no shame from their end there's shame from management end that don't know about spreadsheets don't know how to work with excel and things such as that so that's why bringing this person in he made it so simple that they're not recreating and all they're doing is following it and it's really giving him a, a almost instant vision of where he stands from his revenues expenses and such so that's that's been something that's been helpful he has had, picked up an additional staff member that came out of the treasurer collector's office that has experience with bookkeeping and she is now working in there with them um, she is really brought up what's what's been able to be done with those spreadsheets so he's very happy with her we unfortunately couldn't hire the gentleman full-time that we had because realistically he was looking for a job that would, would compensate over two and a half times and what we would have available but it was it was really a great move so i would draw out a kudos to mr campina and anybody that helped him with it So, we all know where some of us feel about this. I think when, when you look at the budget, you see two line items, or three line items, if we will, for the sewer enterprise fund, and, and that's disturbing because I've also sat and listened to the meeting where they were setting the EU rates, and the first thing I hear is this is a guesstimate. Now, that's not a word that, that you should ever be using when setting the EU rate. <coughs> so, from our standpoint, there's, there's critical issues in, in the Super, inter, super enterprise fund that we're dealing with. One is the betterment, de the deficit caused by the betterment. One is, do we have a correct EDU rate? And then visibility of the retained earnings. So from our standpoint as a community, <coughs> we want to see reporting not just two line items. We want to see an in-depth on it so that we can have a better look at what's actually going on and we can understand better what how money and how it's operating and it is totally different than municipal accounting because it is it's an enterprise fund which is more of a business oriented like we do so is there going to be a chance that we get to see those numbers so yes I've asked that's that where this is going those spreadsheets uh, be brought forward now they they're really the view of what's happened on on day to day it doesn't mean that there couldn't be uh, a double entry or a bill that eventually came came back so they are not it wouldn't be the exact one so I wouldn't take it as the gospel but it gives you the best best vision of what's happened in that department so I've asked Mr. Campina to, to print that out and uh, what it's done as well is when you, when you in your, your large budget books that you have you'll see uh, you'll see you know the non dewatering there, there's all sorts of items right and we've never really accounted for it. What, what this spreadsheet is has done and it's, it's probably a condescending term to label it simply a spreadsheet what, what they put together we now know what each pump house what the electricity has been for that pump house uh, what the what the costs are what the costs of the, and the chemicals and such and I'm smiling because we haven't had that before and how do you really run? How do you, if you start looking and saying, well, well, geez, the, uh, the Jefferson Shores pump house, it's, it's really eating up more electricity than everybody else, but they're not using more, more uh, of the flow. We know what the, what the flow is. So now you know there's something wrong with the system. This is potentially one of the items that will, will help you, you know, to repair something before it's a major issue. We've, I know that we wanted to, to put in the SCADA system, which would really, and that's that should be a real goal for the future as well. But this is, you know, it can be used properly, a powerful tool, and I think this committee is going to be part of how it's properly used. Okay. Anyone? 
All right. Talk to I know that you know, uh, I've been with Guy uh, working on the solar project, and he said that uh, he's finally getting around to um, the water departments, and they're going to try to break away from the uh, EDUs and actually go to water usage, which is really the only fair way to do it, which has been people have been trying to do it for years. But he said that he just got um, he's working with the two water departments now on changing. I'm, I'm curious, and this is this is why I, and I like the idea of the metering type system. But think about it this way: uh, any EDU rate for someone who's a part-time resident, mm -hmm. they're paying that amount. There's several part-time residents, uh, and once you take them out of the equation and put them on metering, I think you're going to see a big jump in some people's metering rates because it's going to fall back on the people that are here 12 months out of the year, as opposed to the people that are here. Or five. And I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. I'm just saying that it's also, it's also, uh, it's also going to protect the commercial people who've been really getting screwed the last 15, 20 years in the sewer system that, that have paid most of everything. And it's, it's just outrageous. It's the only fair way to do it. But isn't all of that up to the sewer commissioners and the board of selectmen? Not I think you said you started to work with it. That's all I mentioned. Again, he may be getting the numbers in place, and now it sounds like like the five-year plan now we have some numbers that we can use as a jumping off point to start talking about it right. you, now you know what you're really budgeting yeah, that's, my my only thing with what's been with the whole edu thing is and and the backwards way that the, the whole sewer fees were were figured out was um they sat down and figured out how much money they needed and figured out how to break it down to the amount of people on the system Okay, that seems pretty backwards to me. They need to figure out what it really costs to operate it. We could find out that truly metering these these systems, if um, if somebody is using something or, or their particular facility uses a lot of water, they're processing a lot of water. Um, you've got a household with seven children, all over the age of fifteen. Really, how many showers? Three showers that? a day. Exactly. <laughs> when you've got an elderly couple who do a couple of dishes and take a bath, you know, three times a week, they may be getting a more of a fair price, right. and we may end up finding out we're collecting more money than we actually had when we said, okay, this is what we need now. Let's break up the pie. So I think that's been people's issues, you know, throughout. Well, in this this spreadsheet sounds wonderful. In fact, that he can see where his money is going, where his greater costs are going, and if there are problems in certain areas or certain um, communities or, or neighborhoods, he can address those issues long before you know it gets out of control. So I think that every every aspect of this needs to be looked at. Yes, yeah, I think it's very appropriate to say that beta uh, compilations. It's they, they've actually brought in the uh, to have a company look into it because we don't we don't have the staff to really you know, go around and look at it but bring it in take a look at it because part of it is you know that you have a base cost so if you have somebody that's a part time resident even if they come in once a year to flush the toilet we need to have the capacity exactly so that capacity to service them so you have a set base. And then I think what they look at is what would the sort of the additional cost be. That's what all that's what all the water does. The two hundred fifty dollar yeah. base, and then right. up over to be up over that you pay. Yeah. But there's also it's not a done deal by any by any fact that, that that's the way it's going to go. Sorry. But, but we need to we can't make a decision until we have the data. It's okay. we. We've shot from the hip a lot, a lot and gone with gut feelings, and we know, all know how that works in business. So. And this, at the end of the day, including the enterprise fund, is a $60 million business. Right. At, at risk of uh, opening, I know this, we were going to cover this on a new business, but at risk of opening up a giant can of worms, do you want to say anything about the parking program or the kiosk tonight? Yeah, no, I, uh, I'm <laughs> very happy of, to speak about it. <laughs> Uh, and naturally, we're more concerned with the revenue aspect of it as opposed to the uh, other issues. Yeah, uh, one of the most interesting parts is, uh, I'm trying to see if I brought it with me, the kiosks, what we saw was um, 
So this was for the weekend. Uh, parking meter one that's located. Let me actually speak before we go into this. The first question is the first question that I had. What did, what did we earn the previous weekend without these? And I believe it or not, we don't have the numbers because we take it all in and deposit it in one lump sum. So realistically, at the end of August, we'll be able to compare it to the last few years worth of deposits in August. And then the following year, you'd really be able to see for the peer to, to see what we're looking at. But I can tell you, for the CW Bishop parking lot, it was six hundred and seventy six dollars and seventy five cents over the weekend, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's six hundred and seventy six dollars that we have never earned before on a weekend. Wow. And that was with a lot that was you know, we hadn't really started the enforcement of it yet. The one of the meters in on the pier had hundred and eighty seven transactions for a total of eleven hundred and thirty five dollars. Nice. And I believe an additional hundred and five dollars in change so that's the interesting part we've never taken cards before we've only taken we had people there to take cash and such so you know you're, you're almost looking at 90 percent of the time people are using the cards the kiosks accept change but they don't accept bills and the reason for that is that's a salt water environment it's also a wet environment now, I'm speaking with the with the Money kiosk money. companies, the bills get so wet and they go in there and now you're, they're clogging. So they've had all sorts of issues with them in the past. It's just not worth it for us to have to deal with that for a convenience factor. Sure. And they're still getting the same amount of money. So, um, Like any new, the other kiosk had 174 transactions for $1,271.50. So I mean, that, we had a, for a weekend, looking <coughs> at uh, almost $3,000, maybe a little over. So it's not a bad deal. Should have been done years ago. Yeah. May I ask, is there a cost to the kiosk? Well, the community events uh, purchased them for us, which was, which was great. Uh, every month there is a, there's a transaction for a credit card, which costs roughly 30 cents, but the you know, <coughs> We're just eating that, if you will, in the fees. So we haven't, we're not going to lose on that because this year, uh, whether it's coin or credit card, the first hour is $2.50. It's actually illegal to charge a credit card transaction fee, believe it or not. We, we can't charge that. So we're fine on that end. We're not losing when people use the credit cards. So, uh, there is. <coughs> Monthly, each one of them costs thirty-five dollars because they have uh, they have the wireless activity, so we can still track them, get the sort of information, and probably every year I would we're going to set aside for at least three kiosks about five thousand dollars worth of whether we are going to have more tickets in there and uh, any maintenance. Uh, that's probably on the high end, but we might as well set that aside and just have it available. These kiosks also are not permanently affixed. We can take them off, which we're planning to do in the off season as one of the, as a potential. Maybe we'll take them off in the off season if we see that they're not working. Maybe we'll leave them. Maybe we're going to move the one from the CW Bishop parking lot to another spot, maybe right by where the pier is. So these have a flexibility to them that are, that's really great. But the main thing is using this year's revenues and the ensuing year's revenues to increase the program. Uh, I know that probably these uh, kiosk companies are going to want us to, to buy 50 to, to 60 or something for the entire town, but we're probably still going to phase it in with a few at a time. At one point, the kiosks were going to run roughly 12 to 15,000 per unit. When we purchased these, we received three for uh, under twenty-three thousand dollars. So they were roughly uh, seven thousand and a little bit change each. So the costs have come down for them as well. Um, so part of this as well was we were maintaining the pier with uh, senior work off, 
And we did also have some really wonderful volunteers who even when they were out after their their time was up or they, they weren't part of the work off, were still working on, on there. But if you looked at it, and uh, we've knocked the senior work off down to $500 this year, but if you had eight people <coughs> working on there from the senior work off to staff it, that's $4,000. So having the kiosks at, if we're setting aside 5000 it's really, there's not that much of a difference. And now, one of the things that's upset people um, is in the past, people were able to, we didn't block off the pier at night. Uh, so before the hours, people could drive in, park before the gate attendants came and put the gate down. Then when they wanted to leave, they could wait till the evening hours, you know, five, six, six o'clock, and drive out, never having paid a dime. This kiosk program doesn't allow them to do it because, yes, we keep the gates open all the time, but we have parking enforcement going through there. So now if they're parked in there and it's off hours, the, there is no off hours. They're running 24-7. So where we would lose spaces, because if you think about it, so every day you lost, you lost 10 spaces and each space was you know, $20. Uh, that's $200 a day over a 13-week program. Now we're going to capture those revenues back, so that, that's good money. We're talking that could we're running close to $20,000 in some parts. So. Is there some spaces there for the businesses that are on the pier? Yes, uh, you know we have the Lady K. Mm -hmm. They have one spot for the boat owner, and then whatever crew he has, whether two or three, they receive a placard and they have been parking in there uh, with the placard. We're probably going to change the way a lot of the things are done and also move what we would consider maybe the, um, the prime spots to up to further lots. Uh, I understand that people are, uh, are employing and doing business in the town, but we also have to make it an attraction and keep it for the people that are coming to spend the, the money in the town as well. And the numbers that you gave don't count any enforcement, any ticketing for those that are not playing. No, and I've, I've asked um, Mr. Buckminster, who's been doing a lot of the enforcement. In fact, we've been, one of the fun things in my job is I can appoint people to ticket enforcement. And uh, the assistant harbor master and four of the seasonal personnel have been appointed. So we also, that's almost a subset of this. In the beaches, uh, you'll notice that there's no longer the attendance in the front. And that's been upsetting some people, but we had senior work off people and 80, 90 degree heat with no, no shed, no air conditioning, and I tell you, it just, it just wasn't right to have them sitting out there all day. Um, so what we've done is we have the signs up. It's, uh, it's a lot that requires whether a resident or you know, to whatever beach pass it is, and they've been coming through and ticketing the people that, uh, that don't have it. I know that Gary personally, over a two week period, have written 150 tickets. Nice. It's, 30, it's $30 a ticket, <laughs> even with some sort of attrition, that's $4,000 you would have never had. And that's not counting the police. I've spoken with acting Chief uh, Walsh to make sure that we're ramping it, ramping it up and keeping on it because we, people are right. It's unfair that if somebody's uh, somebody's paid to have a sticker and somebody's getting away with parking there. So let's make sure. And also, it's to have multiple tickets now. The person that goes in there, if they were going to have to have a day pass for, for $20 or something, they say, oh, well, I've got a ticket, I've been ticketed, I might as well just stay here now for the 30. Well, now that 30 is turning into a 60 and maybe a 90, so you're learning fast that buy the ticket is the cheaper option. I know at the beaches, particularly the little harbor, um, sometimes people go down there and don't realize that they need a pass. And it's if you have a car full of kids, it's a <coughs> tedious process to come back to town hall and get them. Is it possible to get something like a kiosk 
at the beaches so that people could buy a, a day pass there? They do have that <clears throat> ability, but one of the problems that we have is you have Little Harbor as a residence only. How do I have it with the kiosk to prove that they're, they're residents? So there's, we're, we just don't have that capacity. And I know it doesn't help the people at Little Harbor, but the, the Harbor Masters, uh, it's not a shack, it's a nice little place on the pier, but we call it a shack. They sell some of the passes as well. Uh, it would be, you know, we, we have all of these beaches and some of the restrictions and such. We don't, we don't have buildings selling, uh, selling water or, or candy or, or ice cream out of them and the ability to maybe buy the pass for, for the day. And that's really something as we start ramping it up, making it more friendly for, for people to come buy the, buy the passes and such. And there's always, well, the simplest thing I've learned in government is the, the easiest idea is usually the, the hardest one to enact and has the most pitfalls. <laughs> Can't say that's going to be the one that, that happens instantly, but those are the type of things we should we should be looking at because that's lost revenue as well. I'm a little confused. What are you talking about when you're talking about day passes? I thought that those other on the reason we can't put parking meters on like Shell Point and in, in um, Little Harbor is because they were granted as resident privilege only. Um, so, I mean, is there can a non-resident go buy a pass to go down to Shell Point? Uh, there's no passes for Shell Point. Oh, okay. Shell Point's free and open so to anyone. Shell day passes. Well, not necessarily for Little Harbor, but oh, for right. on Swiss Beach. Uh, the, you have the the residents can. There's I know that they sell some sort of day pass for. Do you I use Swiss Beach? Do mm -hmm. I use Swiss Beach? No, to use Swiss I, Beach. I, I I was my understanding those were resident passing only. I mean, I just give Gary a call. I'm just, just curious. <laughs> <laughs> it's a guest pass. A someone, guest someone pass? who's a resident has a guest coming in. They can go in and get a guest pass for someone for the day. Okay, so using their resident. A resident can get a guest pass, so so their guests can come on their car for the day only. I see. Okay, thank you for clearing right. it up. This is done. It's good to have them around. <laughs> I, I think what Dave was mentioning earlier, though, when you drive out there, if you are a resident haven't gone to town hall during the hours that they're open to pay your money to get uh -huh. the beach permit on the one car that you can put it on um, and you have the grandkids come to town and you want to buzz them over there there is no mechanism on Saturday to go be able to use the beach if you're a resident right. and you haven't already done that so that would be a nice <coughs> consideration and I, I like the bigger picture that Derek's always looking to ways to make revenue you know we have a concession stand over there they can sell the passes too and They can go to the parts of here and say. I did not somewhere. know that until today. I'm very yeah, happy to that's good. That. Well, Maybe we can get <coughs> a signage down at Little Harbor that says if you need a day pass, please see the Harbor Master on Ons of Pier. Yeah, well, don't, uh, yeah, don't call me, but I think it's up there. <laughs> okay. I never saw it. <laughs> I've, I've, I've seen it. There is a sign. Just one final point and I'm not insensitive to all of the problems around the parking issue, but I like what we're all, all focusing on. It's the money. That's our job to focus on the money. Our job isn't to focus on where the business owners are gonna park, where the other, our job is to look at the money and, and somebody else's job to make everybody else happy. Good luck with that. But I would go, like to go with the signs because I think that full disclosure, people really can't complain. So when you do come up with that, this is the, reserved for business owner, reserved for resident, when we do finally figure out where the residents are going to be allowed to park in front of their own homes, you put up those signs that say, or oh, your car will be towed. You know, it, it's a very sad thing that I don't like that we're going to have to do that, but it's done in so many yeah, other yeah. communities that we've been to. You know, that's what happens. You park where you're not supposed to be, they come and take your car, and that's but thank you for at least we finally getting some revenue and some numbers on it. So. The, uh, that's part of, if we will, this is sort of our pilot program. Obviously enacting something mid-year or mid-season, mid if you will, isn't the best case scenario, but it's the way everything ended up. And sitting on the meters until the following year was just, it just wasn't an option. We need to, to look at it. The, uh, 
where, where we stand right now, this is really sort of a pilot program. We know that the CETA is working on a parking study for onset because it, I think we're, we're seeing that. There should be some areas probably that are residents only parking uh, so people can park in front of their own house. <laughs> uh, there, there's some areas that we need to figure out there for some of the businesses. And also, what that helps do is it funnels the, the tourists and the day trippers into our, into our paid parking areas. So I think that's, you know, there, there's a whole big picture of this and how you put it together, which will never make any, everybody happy, but it's something that will benefit the, the whole community and eventually throughout the whole town itself, not just parts of it. Great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next up is media and media relations. I'll just, uh, just a quick thing. We've been asked at our last meeting, which I know that I know you were attending, if we would consider moving to the collective room for Wednesday night. Uh, obviously, we don't want the same configuration that the selectmen have, and we're, it, it allows us from a media standpoint or media relations standpoint to get our message out quicker because he's talked, uh, Mr. White is talking about doing live broadcasts on Wednesday evening and one of the things we talked about was the configuration. And if you look at the selectman's setup now, it's kind of like a really bad horseshoe that doesn't come in the middle. And what, what we talked about was making it more of a horseshoe, obviously moving the uh, King and Queen chairs to the back and sitting in regular chairs for the finance committee. And I, just before we get into the, the hardcore media relations and stuff, I, I, are we, is anybody opposed to the idea or anybody for it? I just throw them out there. And I'm sorry to <laughs> tonight. Uh, before I leave, one of the things is I know the school committee meets on the same night and with them moving over here, it might be an option for them using that room as well. So I'm more I'm more interested in what WCTV has to say. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just just giving the and like I said, there's always a, there's always a problem on the easiest things. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's either us or the school committee. What there will be a request from the board of selectmen to WCTV to uh, audio and video auditorium. Pardon me. Audio and video of the auditorium, so we can do live broadcasts of the auditorium. What auditorium? Town Hall auditorium. Hall auditorium. Yeah, but that's some oh, of the worst sound qualities. What includes is also putting up the shielding up on the ceiling to improve the sound. Right. And also, well, there's also a CPA request for uh, remodeling the side of the But at this point, we don't. That's it's, down the road. It's not down the road. So the audio and video and the ceiling is soon. Okay. We can request that immediately. Yeah. Well, I'm going to leave it to uh, Mr. White. Do you have any comments to make before we start the process? I would submit that even though the Board of Education physically moves here, their meetings have been officially held in the, in the middle school, so I would not see a direct conflict. Uh, there may be some details that have to be worked out so that their meeting can go live at the same time your meetings go live. You do start earlier than they do it. They start at 7, I think. Yeah. Um, but the concept is, do you want to meet in a room that is wired for live broadcast, or do you want to continue to meet in a room like this, which is not really set up for it. Live broadcast is not an option. But to have your meetings taped and then uh, <coughs> um, delayed, in essence. Um, I know your, your messages are timeless, but you'd like to get them out, out as early as possible. I think that's something that we're going to concentrate on this year is a little bit more media, media relations to get the message out so uh, people, especially with town meeting, get it out beforehand. So, so anybody want to? Go ahead, Dom. Well, benefits, pros and cons on, on live. What makes you think that a live broadcast is going to benefit the public? 
You believe that? That's the discussion. You believe it? What it does is, this is the only thing I can think of, if there's an important message that we're getting out, that's a live broadcast, then the person has to watch it that moment, that night, where it's taped and it goes on the air, they have the option to watch it when they can watch it. Just something I wanted to bring on. I mean, I'm not crazy about live stuff, but you know, anything goes wrong. Okay, I'll make sure your makeup's perfect. No, it's not makeup. You know, I don't give a shit what I look like. I'm talking about what we're going to say, you know. I don't know, it's just some places. I don't like them. This is on. To we this go. point, it would still be, there would still be a re I assume there would still be a rebroadcast of it, so they'll have the option done. Okay. Um, and and I don't really care whether it's live or not. I think one of the problems because I've seen if you if you miss a meeting and you ask, Bob will give you the disc and you can sit through this meeting. It's a lot more fun to be here the first time. The sound quality in this room is this not is good, yeah. and I've been listening to some of us at the meetings and. It's really frustrating when you know that someone is saying something important and you can't hear, and you can't hear it. So I think going to, I, as much as I, I think, I didn't call them king and queen chairs, I think I referred to them as thrones, but I don't want to sit there. Same concept. But, but I think that the sound in that room, I know people complain about the sound there too, but I think overall the filming quality is better. So um, I, I guess I would live with being in that room. You're absolutely right. In this room, we've got one camera angle. Up there, we've got three. Uh, <clears throat> the microphones can be controlled a little better because I anticipate that we have more or less individual microphones, or at least for a couple of people at a time. And as far as um, live versus um, taped, Dominic, you have not been able to curtail yourself in a tape broadcast, so I wouldn't <laughs> worry about you curtailing yourself in a live one. Uh, the, uh, I would anticipate that the live broadcast would be copied just like we do for the selectmen and would be replayed at some other prearranged time so you could uh, look at it at any time. And I believe many of these things, if not all, I could be wrong, but I think they're all on demand. Anyway. They are all on demand. Oh, okay. So we can demand to see your performance. You can go and watch yourself on demand. <laughs> Are we looking from a time frame standpoint when we make the decision? Do we need to? If you make the decision tonight, I would anticipate meeting with you or someone you designate and working out an acceptable arrangement because I don't think we need to discuss it at the committee. We just present it and see what, what you all think of it. Yeah. Um, if you're meeting next week, I would work to try and get you to be able to go there next week. I don't think we're meeting next week. But but between now and the next meeting, we could have the details worked out and be prepared to meet there. Any, At least to try it. Anybody else? You sign on for live TV, it's for your first night you're going to get the. That's right. That's right. I'm in favor of it. I think if the acoustics and the, and the visuals are better, it's better for the town, it's better for the, the committee. And, and you make a good point, David, because <clears throat> as an observer and a Longer spectator of this committee. Spectator only. Member. Member. Uh, yeah, but yes, but most recently spectator. It's very frustrating to hear you all speak about what's in your hand. I would like to set up an objective, a way to be able to project these documents that you're looking at to a um, screen so that the public or whomever is watching can see the same things you're seeing. That may be a little more of a complex issue because sometimes it's jumping back and forth and the public is not going to be able to follow back and forth. But it provides the opportunity for a com completer education about what you're talking about. I was just PS to the earlier conversation about town meeting. Um, I think that that's one of the things that we do, don't do well. We've discussed the town meeting warrant items ad nauseum, forward, back, and sideways. We've that sat through hours of discussions. We get up there at town meeting, and we forget that people haven't had a chance to read through it all. I think that's the same thing at our meetings. If it's going to be broadcast, it's the only way that we're going to get the information out there. We may have to be a little more detailed when we speak about to start a discussion or something. You, if you, as a committee, if we want to give it a try at our next meeting and then see how it goes, 
And um, I also, I want to mention the camera that you're using versus the camera up there. Is that there's a huge difference in the video quality? Is that what you're saying as well? Yes, and <clears throat> those are positioned higher, and you get a better, better angle. And there are zoom lenses on them so that you can see the people that are talking. Yeah, so they take off ten pounds. <laughs> yeah, yes, they do. In fact, there's a special filter. There's a special filter on each one of them that allows to drop ten pounds. Oh, yes. So you about So you're saying if we go up there, that you can um, you have the capability to to put our paperwork on as we're at a live meeting. I'm saying that we would make that as a as a goal. Okay. Yeah. There is a projector up there. There's a screen up there. They're permanently mounted. Um, so that would be something at a later date. Huh? That's a later date then. That's not immediate. Oh no no no. But we have to make sure that if you can't, we can project it. But if you can't read it, because this kind of detail mm -hmm. in text is different than if you're showing a photograph. Photographs, I think, are reasonable when you see them on TV. But these figures may not come through unless they're prepared in a way. In a bigger print, in a bigger print. font. Yeah. I've never seen it. I know what the concept is and how it works. Um, but I've never seen the material up there, so it would be, have to be something. But we, too, would need to slow down if you're discussing something, making sure that we get it under under the, the scanner and you know, say, you know, so that he can switch back and forth as you're talking about it. Um, this, it, it would certainly be a way for us to better educate the public um, as to what we're looking at. Um, I mean, this, this five-year plan, as far as I'm concerned, ought to go up on the town website. Okay, so people can see it. I hope so. Um, but I, I have no problem with I don't, that. I don't have anything on there about a vote. I don't know that we necessarily have to take a vote to give it a try. The only thing we need to do is make sure that Kelly knows in advance that there will be a venue change. Okay, that's fine. All right. Then we that segues right into what your comments and some of the other comments right into media relations. So take it away, Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Bob. I think that was media liaison last year. And I don't think I did a whole lot with it, in part because we were really building bridges of communication last year between the school committee and the board of selectmen. And although this committee is not political, we really focus on the issues and the finances. We try to be um, somewhat sensitive to how the scenario will play out. Uh, I think we're at a better point now that we're all on the same page, realizing what kind of fiscal problems we have, and we're all moving forward on it. So. I think at that point now, rather than pointing fingers and jumping up and down, we can really focus on the issue, and it's time to get that information out there. I think that five-year plan should be in papers, or at least the synopsis of it. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have, way back when, when I came on, you guys were here first, there was usually a report in the room. Mm -hmm. So although we were not on camera, camera makes us behave much more um, appropriately. Um, we had reporters in the room, so we still had to watch ourselves. And it's been quite a while since we had a member of the press any time except just before town meeting. Um, I understand these are not exciting meetings to sit through. Their resources are limited, too. But it makes it very difficult that people don't know what we're talking about. Um, so I guess one of the first things that select a, a suggestion had come to my attention from the former chair. Um, but I, I think we need to introduce ourselves and let people know who we are um, and what, very basically, what our goals are. So I, I actually would like to start. I've spoken with the and we have encouraged, not contacted the Standard Times, but as far as getting the information in there. Um, just a quick aside, Kelly, you and I had spoken at one point about our minutes being online. Yes. And you said that you submit them to the town clerk. Yes. And then you're still not being posted. Yeah, I gotta have that conversation. Okay. Yeah. Because I um, mean to have any of the meetings pretty Yeah, good. at one point it was very good. Kelly Kelly will get the minutes done very quickly and they go out there. At one I point I thought I was able to do it myself, but then I was told to submit them to the town clerk and they would put them on the website. Okay. And they're not on the website. So I'm wondering, you know, maybe we will just post minutes. So I guess my concern, and this goes to the, the <clears throat> bigger voice that we have as a committee, we don't always agree on items. Our votes are sometimes uh, 
usually not unanimous, that's good. There's usually several sides to a story. So I, I've been very cautious in not trying to say the finance committee says or the finance committee feels because I can only speak for a majority or a minority. So I would like to have a, um, try to get things out fairly and partially. So maybe for each meeting, um, the end of it, we just recap what needs to go in the paper, what we can kind of decide as a board what points need to get out there. Somebody also put the idea out there about a Facebook page for the finance committee, which I thought was very interesting, but I have to run that by the um, I Okay, I, I'm getting off a little electronically sad. Well, I was just going to say, the, I, I, th I think it's the AG. I'm not really sure, but I have to check um, open meeting and, and however else that works. There's, there's a lot of issues there before we open that up to a Facebook page. I have a hard enough time with my own family Facebook page. Yeah. Depends on what sort of Facebook page you're doing, because if you do a Facebook group or something like that, there's just informational information. Yeah. It's not like you can sit there and, and I can't you know, send me all in a text message back and forth. It's not that kind of Facebook page. It's you can like set it up. Is wrong, you're yes, just putting exactly. Out it's information okay. only. It's not like a group session where you can have a little chit chat back and forth. Only certain administrators can actually post something on it. Other people cannot. They can comment back and forth, however. That's the way you need to be careful is anybody who, who likes the page can comment on the page, but you don't want to get into open meeting law where you are having a discussion on the page. Um, that's when you get into your problem. And, and that's, that's the issue that I have. Um, <coughs> three new members will go through the open meeting laws and conflicts of interest and all those wonderful things that we have to learn about. Um, so I'm curious because it would be open always to the public. So it would, it would be open be, to the public. Always yes. open to the public, even if we're commenting on it. It's not. We got enough to do. I know Don also on that. We got enough to do. Don't no worry about that, Josh. We'll post pictures on it. Yeah, I'm actually do. very okay. careful. Okay. So <laughs> I, I'm interested in hearing what other feedback, what what people think that we need. We keep saying we need to get our information out there, and, and I guess this is the only way I'm. It is the new age way to get it out there. I'm not saying it isn't, but I'm, not I'm sure the open Twitter. meeting people have have looked into ways to control this and, and things like that. You just need to be very careful. I can tell you that you know I you know well, Larry knows how much I absolutely stay away from certain media aspects. Um, but I got into Twitter and <laughs> I actually connected with Wham Weekly through Twitter. Uh, but what I am careful with that is, is it's nice because I can, it picks up and gives me all of the news feeds that are in their paper and I can read what I want to read. Um, but what I do stay away from is I won't answer or I won't comment on Wayham Week's page, okay? If I'm going to respond, I can tweet back to them, I'm in support of this or I'm not in support of this. Um, but I stay away from I don't know if it's blogging or what it is, but the, the anonymous commenting that goes back and forth. Um, so those are the things that you, you realize that you will be, because it would be, if you, if you set up some sort of Facebook page like that, if, if you lock down commenting or things like that, because you're going to have people out there who just want to be mean, um, and start mouthing off or shooting off at the FinCom on their Facebook page. All right, so I'm not really media savvy on how those kinds of things work, but I know you can limit what can be put on there and who can have access. So it would have to be, like, like I said, an informational thing only without any interaction or response, I guess would be my, my thing. Anybody? I don't like it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, surprisingly <laughs> enough, the old man in the crowd, I, uh, I attended a, not long ago a thing on social media because as a business, I, my company is started in 1940 and the concept of social media scares them to death. And so now after his son who's now part of the business and myself have attended this, we actually have a Facebook page. And uh, one of the things we're learning is there, there's a responsibility that comes with that mm -hmm. page. You just there's certain things you can't post out there. And I don't believe if you're just a page where people can like you, 
And you can, the, the administrators can post it, and you can make it a private page. I don't think that's possible yeah. because it is a governmental thing, so I think it has to be public. But one of the things that make the difference is, and I think this is what, what uh, Mrs. Donahue said, and it, it, we need to be able to talk about the facts. We are not about opinions, and we don't engage. I know that's really difficult, and it's taken me, what am I, my third year now, I, you just don't engage. If, if somebody wants to insult you or insult the work of the committee, and believe me, it's nothing new that they insult the finance committee, and half the time they have no idea what they're talking about. So instead of going out and correcting them, which I have done in the past, <laughs> you should not do that. Uh, our goal is to inform the public. Our goal is not to argue with the public. Our, our goal is not to, to uh, have opinions. It's to inform the public of the facts of what we're dealing with as a committee. So as long as we keep that in mind, whatever we go with a Facebook page or a whatever the where well, I'm, going, I'm going to go with the but even with the papers, I actually lost, but I was just going to I'm comment to that. that I, I'm married. I think. Sorry. The, even with the papers, they have a comment section. And we tend to refer to it as a blog, but it really is more a comment, and public comment if you post a, an editorial or an article. In the old days, you would write a letter to the paper, and then somebody else would write a letter back. Now it's just so much faster, because you can go click, click, click. And, oh, you don't have to sign your name and be verified. You can be anonymous. Um, I have responded to those maybe a half a dozen times in the past year, and I've had very good response to my comment, because my comment, like Bonnie says, just the facts. I, they can go opinion back and forth, but if there's in, misinformation, and I do read them, I will comment on the misinformation, give them the correction. And it pretty much, I found, in most of the cases, stops the discussion, stops the, the yeah. antagonism. It's very interesting mm -hmm. that when you use your real name and you have some authority, mm -hmm. then it just settles down a little bit. But I wouldn't count on that being a ongoing thing all the time. All the time. And I have no desire to engage in it. And the good part is I go on once and read it. That's it. I don't, I'm not on there all the time. I don't see it. But anything that we put in the papers is still subject to that kind of comment whether we're on a Facebook page or not. So um, I would just, it, it tends to be less personal when it's out in public. In the past, there were some private blogs that got very ugly, but you had to go search them out. Could work. I don't know, imagine that. Uh, but because they're affiliated with newspapers and maybe anyone can read them, they tend to um, lose themselves a little bit better. So I, I guess that's what we're going to try to do. Well, I think the Facebook one, we need to probably have a little more. Discussion. Oh, I'll get all the information yes. before we do things. Yeah. Oh, I saw that look. <laughs> Ow. <clears throat> I think the one thing that the Finance Committee has to keep in mind, you are a committee of town meeting. You are not a committee, say, of the Board of Selectmen um, or an advisory committee. Your role is to advise town meeting. So therefore, you're not technically a public committee. So I think before you go to Facebook or that group, yes. you may want to have a conversation with town council. I think so. Um, yeah, there's a lot of research. Yeah, there's a lot of that's, what that's that, not, not to try to dampen your spirit, but if you look at the charter and the role of what the committee is, I think you have to understand the role of the finance committee and that you are a committee of town meeting. And your role is to report to town meeting, not to the public. You're not a public committee. You have a responsibility to the public, but at town meeting. So I think... How do you, uh, how do you differentiate one to the other? I don't understand you how you can differentiate one to the other. You have to go back and look. You have to go back and read the charter. But town. read the charter. What does the charter say that your role is? Department. Your role is to advise town meeting. But who is town meeting? Town meeting is the public, but town meeting is not an open and public town meeting. It, it's a legislative body. It's, so it's I, I just would caution you that I think you ought to have a discussion with town council before you jump on it. I, I agree. That's, that was the conversation uh, before we get into the whole Facebook thing. I mean, I, there are several responsibilities with social media that you have to be cognizant of. But as far as the newspaper and getting our message out through there through some sort of a, I don't want to call it a blog, but a fact sheet, I think that's something that does advise town meeting because it allows us to 
pre-program people or pre-inform them before they get to town meeting. So I, I don't have any problem using that approach, but I do think we need to have a discussion when we get into the other aspects well, of social media. And I, I think to start with, again, my intro will be the makeup of the committee and our job and our focus, which is just that. Um, and then after that, I think maybe in arrears we'll post our minutes. If nothing else, we can always post the minutes of the meeting there um, if they're not getting up on the website. So that is factual information, and, and we can go from there. But no, I just I wanted to just put the social media thing out there because I just can I can I be the the what is it? The horse the ass probably said that. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Like we that. can put out a million things of factual information, but there are still going to be people that say, why hasn't the Finance Committee got this information out? Right. Because you didn't read it. So why we're doing a good thing, and I think that it'll help some people, we need to keep in mind that, that there is a segment of the population that no matter what we do, we're not going to be informing right. them because they just simply don't want to be informed at that point. They yeah. want to be informed at a later point. So. I think that was my whole point is that, you know, um, so people will ignore everything going on around them until town meeting. And it's like a week before town meeting, they want to know everything right now. And it's not that, I mean, yes, we need to report to town meeting, but we spend an entire year doing this, okay? It's not two weeks before town meeting. And as long as we're doing these things, the voting public needs to either take the time to listen to what we say or we have to force speed it out there. Well, that's what I think we, that's have, it. we have to bring it forth and, and then we can only do what we can do. I think I think the, the avenue that we're using is right for now, and maybe there are other avenues afterwards. But um, you want to tell? You want to say something to us? Oh, okay. thank you. Because I, I didn't you. see you raise your arm, but I thought I could see yeah. you want to say something. Yeah, I, I, I think. Recognize. I, I I'm think sorry. This is the former chair. I, I think Mr. Smith, Claire has is 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 right on target. I mean. We, how many times we've gone to town meeting, and I don't, any controversial matter that comes up, can somebody from the finance committee tell us what you think? Can somebody from the finance committee? We are their body. We are, they count on us to tell them. So you, we really, you really have to concentrate on that body right then and there, because I don't think you're going to get it. Lou Smith or Lou, Lou Jones out. And, and, and unless, unless you're looking to go out and capture more people to come to town meeting, that would be a good idea. That's a nice idea. Get, get uh, the wheelers on it. They did a good job before. But I think you really have to pay attention to that town meeting because they pay attention to you. And they respect you all. And it, it, it's, 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 it's one of the only boards that I have seen that the, the thoroughly the town respects because we're not political because you're not political. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got to move along. Is there? We're done. Want to wrap it up for now? All right. Well, because Tom Worthing's not here tonight, I think that we take all the liaisons on assignments and give them to Tom. Yes. Any thoughts? All in favor. All right. We can do the liaison assignments at our next meeting, but I want you all to think about some of these. These are critical things that you don't have to go to every meeting, but you need to be in contact with them and understand and bring it back to the committee because I think this is part of understanding the budget, part of part of uh, dealing with the budget is to know what's going on in certain areas. Uh, and I jotted down some because I know that we need a representative for the community events. Can we already decide someone for that because I know you can't do it anymore. We need somebody to um, capital planning and community events. Capital events. planning and community events are critical. So capital planning meets during the day, which leaves me out. Uh, so if anybody's interested in liaisoning with capital planning, community events. So what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll give you the list tonight, but next week if we don't have anybody do it, we're gonna have to sign somebody. So the library, and that's something that's that's critical as well, COA. Dom, since you're already over at the uh, 
Is there a treatment plan? You want to be able to do that on that? Yep. Did you do the Harbor Master too? I will if you want. All right. I'll take care of the town administrator and the town accountant treasury. We need the uh, liaison to the school department as well. That uh, keeps up with that. That's the direct down. Uh, municipal maintenance. I, well, I really, in a sense, because it's it's public safety. I think I want to do municipal maintenance and the police together. That you going to do that? Uh, no. Oh, I but said, you would I think like, I'd to like to do that. that one. I think I. I don't think I'll be doing that one. I see. So you want to you want to combine those together? Yeah, I like to say? combine municipal maintenance. Okay. Safety. Safety. Because I think you're you're. you're to do that and I know Tom has been interested in the police so he will be working on that one so that's Tom uh, that one was easy sir. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to refer back to uh, Mr. Heath is there anything specific I'm missing that needs a representative anything what any any department in town that or committee that we need to have a liaison that is critical other than the ones we've talked about Capital planning. Capital planning. Well, capital planning. That's absolute. Yeah, that means during the day, so I'll have to get somebody assigned to that. When does that mean? Are there appointed? There's nothing else that I know that's appointed much other. When does when does capital planning meet on? Friday. Friday. Friday morning. Morning. You mean on Friday mornings? Every Friday or? No, no, no. I mean, it depends upon something like here. Uh, normally, it's once a month, uh, unless you start getting into the annual okay. presentation town meetings. Can you do that? I'd like to try to do that. Okay. That's a critical committee. So we're going to tweet. We'll, if you have any, if you have, send me an email if you're interested in any of those committees we talked about. If not, then next week we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about this site. Next week? Uh, not next week. Next meeting. Sorry. Okay. Which okay. is next week? I know we're not there yet. Okay. Okay. We need to, I need a motion to approve the minutes from June 26th. Make a motion to approve the minutes of June 26th. Second. Second. Any changes? You guys, we're not here. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Four zero zero. Four zero two. Three. Sorry. Four zero three. I'll abstain. All three. All right. Sorry. All right, next meeting the time. I, I, all right. Let me get my little notes out. Um, you see, you see, it's on the third Monday, right? She was put on that day for you, so maybe. I know. So you guys can change. change. They can change it. Okay. Yeah, the management letter and the management letter. Let's see if I get there and get an update on the numbers as well. The next meeting, we, we, we try to meet on the. I don't, next week, next week is not necessary. <coughs> How about if we met on the 14th of August? We need to cover the. If you'll look through the audit, we need to cover that. I think by then, there we should have some numbers, and I'll update it later on that. We should have got to be a little more like that. And then we'll also talk more about the media, but then we'll have some answers. Does that work for you? Six thirty on the fourteenth, correct? Six thirty on the fourteenth. We we may be meeting upstairs. I'll it'll I'll inform you. I have a question for you. Um, he said this. This is we have to read this. Um, didn't he also say that he was getting Powers and Sullivan, Derek, that he was getting them to do? One for the enterprise fund. Yes, no. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's not going that's to be a quick one. That's going to take a long. Time. That is. Uh, this is basically, I believe, 2012. I okay. just completed 2013. So again, what we talked about is being a little bit behind the, the curve here because we didn't get these till late. And and this is, you know, this is what helps us understand where the problems are in town and where they need to be corrected. We need to be able to. Count on our financial information being accurate. Yes. And when you read through this, you're not going to feel as comfortable with that. So it's just important that you read through it and understand. Or if you don't understand any questions, you know, feel free to drop an email or, or bring the notes to the next meeting so that we can all talk about it. Okay. All right? Did you guys all get emails? Email 
Cedar is going to be funding most of the forest. We're also putting a Facebook in, so your questions about Facebook and open meeting law and everything else will all be discussed with town council starting tomorrow. And so we continue back there. The idea is we'll have links to every department in town so they'll have their own piece. So will it, we're finance. getting away, we're, we're getting rid of the virtual town hall thing? No, the virtual town hall thing is still, the virtual computer system is, there. Okay. is still, a whole other issue that hasn't been resolved. What it is, our existing website is going to get completely revamped and done. Uh, oh, okay. And then we're also putting in a Facebook page as well. Uh, the other issue we have, which is a little touchy, is the selectors have a policy that's been in effect for quite a while that nobody's ever followed. Anybody wanting, any town entity that wants to request to use CPA funding has to get a letter of approval from both the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee before they apply to the CPA, CPC. They've not done this for years. The reason being is the town entity, they want to make sure before we spend the time, etc., that whatever they're looking for is something that's financially feasible, long-term, short-term for the town. And it saves a lot of time. You don't have to go to the town meeting. It doesn't have to sit there and discuss something that's really not going to work. It is a policy. It's not a bylaw or anything else. And I have a question whether the board is likely to have a policy for the, actually for the finance committee because we're two different branches of the government. Uh, but the bottom line is that we, last night we voted to go ahead and allow the library to seek the CA, CP, CPC to, see, to uh, seek C, CPA funding for the rules playground and what we do there. <coughs> we have reservations about it, but we allow them to go ahead and far. I still have to come back to town first before town meeting. It's supposed to go to you before they go. Well, I know, but it's still going to have to come back to us now. But it's supposed to go to you first to I get agree. a lot of approval before they even go there. Oh, oh, That's oh, number oh, one. Oh. Number two, there was also a request for town entity, which is municipal maintenance technically, for uh, basically renovation of the auditorium. Uh, neither one of us have had a uh, request by that particular entity to come before we board yet. And that particular issue there is we have questions from the board. Uh, what are the restrictions going to be if they take CPA money as far as renovation inside that hall? Then they, that's something we probably need to ask. So all I'm, all I'm trying to avoid is that basically you should be requesting those two entities to come before you to get a letter of approval. CPA is from municipal maintenance and municipal maintenance and, and library. 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 Okay. Hold on, This is Donna. You go sure. first. Yeah. I, so this is a. Policy. It's a selectless policy that's been in place for a while. And the idea was to make sure that any town entity, which could be a town employee, town department, committee, board, commission, etc., anything that is, that is a town entity has to first get the letter of approval for both the may board of selectmen and the finance committee before they actually apply. May I make a suggestion through the chair, through the board of selectmen, to the CPC? that the CPC adopt that as their own policy, or we recommend that they adopt that as their own policy. One of the issues we've had in the past, I think we've all seen the CPC articles that have come in here, the CPC is not a gatekeeper. They look at themselves purely administratively. They look at a project to see if it qualifies by the letter of the law. They do not cut programs because it's a bad idea or because it costs too much money. If it qualifies, <coughs> they will pass it. So I think this is actually probably a good thing. I'm not sure when we fit into the chain of events, but it would probably be better if it were part of their policy. Can't be because they, they work under the, on the state and that's federal laws. So they can't even have that as their own. I think his point was that these are what you you you, these you, you are town, talk right town, town entities. entities. Okay. Not, right. not, not exactly. non non right. citizens. These yes. are these town. are town entities that are looking to get CPA funding which affects financial interests of the town. Okay, makes sense. Right. So, if the, board of if the Board of Selectmen turns it down, doesn't doesn't go any farther? Correct. Doesn't have to come to us. If it passes if you and comes to us and we turn it down, doesn't go any farther? Technically, that's what it clear both of us. So then when you mentioned that, so municipal maintenance and 
They should request a hearing to us. We shouldn't request a hearing from them. So the policy says they have to come before. Right. You. So you said we should invite them in. They should. They should ask. They should ask. Them. Absolutely. Yeah, they, 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 they need to see us. Let them make the first one. Well, it's it's everybody. It's a it's a policy that nobody has set and nobody's enforced it for a long time. And again, the finance committee functions as a legislative branch. So what I'm saying is the selection policy, which I don't believe holds, holds any, any weight at all. Because I've already, we've already had this issue back in capital planning three, four years ago. I think you're looking at the person that told the board of selection, no. Uh, so all I'm saying is it's in, the, it's in the interest of the finance committee to look at something ahead of time because that's part of what your interest is. Right. If we're going to go ahead and spend money, and it's going to cost the town money going forward, then we have the money in place to do the things that are necessary. The policy, I don't believe, is enforceable as far as the finance committee goes, but I think it's in the best interest of the town is working with well done. Okay. Because you look at it differently than <coughs> I look at it. Right. And this is one of the things that I have noticed over the past, past couple of years, is that there have been articles that have come and have been put on the warrant without proper voting financially that you have discussed and opened your discussion before it got on the warrant. And this, exactly what Alan is saying, um, under CPC warrant articles with town entities coming to put on a warrant article, it should be vetted by the yeah, finance right. committee first as to whether that's in the best interest. And if it's not, then you make a recommendation to the board of selectmen that it not go on the warrant. I mean, just because something is presented, they're not mandated to put it on the warrant, except for petition articles. If it's not in the best interest of the town, they have every right as, as a board not to, to move that forward and put it on the warrant. And that's why it's so important to talk about these warrant articles before the warrant closes, not after. Because once they close the warrant, they have actually taken a vote to put that on the warrant. So when it comes before a town meeting, I can't say this has been improperly put on, because they voted to put it on. So it puts me in a predicament as a town moderator. And, and there have been a couple of articles where afterwards I've chastised them and said, you know, that should not have gone on the warrant, but I can't technically throw it out because you voted as a board to put it on and your vote is a, is a signature of approval. Do we so need to contact this, those two departments to facilitate, to facilitate okay. the process? To get everybody used to it, it would be better to do it that way. Yes, you know, the, the chairman of, the, of CPC understands she's got a lot of from the board reminding them that this particular process is supposed to happen, but I can't guarantee that, that CPC will follow through. But what we'll do is we'll inform through the town administrator, which is the way that we should do it, uh, that we would like to have them appear accordingly. But I need a little help with the policy number. And, this refers to the town policy. That way, we can make it more official. No, I've got my car. Is that a 1946 policy? <laughs> 1988. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a little later than that. All right. What? Well, what else? It's in the policy book anyway. So. Okay, you had three. You had two. What's three? Okay. That was it. One, two. No, no, okay. Motion. All right. Then I will. Hold on. I will. Uh, <laughs> with you to get the policy numbers yeah. and we'll take care of that. And just real quickly, you have meetings on the 1st of August and the 8th of August for the Board of Selectmen with uh, one of the, we're doing a workshop right. on the sewer project and what we're going to decide to do as far as planning for the sewer and how we're going to go forward with sewer in general. And the other one is the, to do with, is with the chairman of the finance committee coming, school committee, etc. We're talking about the budget for the existing budget for this year because we still know they have issues and also the budget for 2014. The very donuts. All right. So those will be two. You can come to those workshops. They're open to the public. Okay. First, and what was that again? All right. Uh, First of me. I uh, will introduce the motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed?